My guest today is a friend and advocate for inclusivity in the workplace, Nisa Farley. This episode of Design Today is brought to you by me. Design Today is more than just a podcast. We are building a community of hungry UX designers. Want to join that community? Head over to designtoday.com and sign up to receive a Slack channel invite. Do you really want to show your love and support for the show? Then consider becoming a patron. As you know, this work is a labor of love and any donation not only means a ton, but goes a long way in fueling the engine. Visit designtoday.com to learn more about our community and resources. Now back to the show. Nisa is currently the Director of Product Management at CHG Healthcare. However, at the time of this recording, she was the Senior Manager of Product Development at Western Governor University. She comes with a long background of management experience, experience in which has highlighted in her career the need to speak up about inclusivity in the workplace. On this episode, she covers things that you can do to also become an advocate for this group, how you can become more self-aware of the situations around you and inside of the workplace. I admittedly am not the most experienced person to be having this conversation with, but over the last couple of years, I've had some really interesting and insightful learnings on this topic. And I was eager to have Nisa on the podcast to help us learn more. Let's get going. Okay, let's go ahead and get into this. Nisa, thank you for joining me on the Design Today Show. Thank you for having me. I'm this, very excited. No, this is great. We met, how many months ago was that event that we did together? Oh, maybe six months ago now. Six months back. And I remember at that event, I asked you about wanting to, if, if you'd be interested in coming on the show, to which you said you were. Sorry it took so long. No, but, you're a popular guy. Well, I'm not, I don't know if that's the <laughs> truth. But at the very end of it, it was just, uh, this is the timing that worked out. So I appreciate you being able yeah. to spare some time with me. Yeah, very excited. Thank you. Uh, we've got a very cool topic that I have not covered on any podcast before. So uh, I'm really excited to get into this one. And you are the perfect person to speak on this. Uh, before we get into it, give me a little bit of your background, those who are listening, uh, a little bit of your background. So... Uh, I guess they so they understand why you're so close to it and how you got into this. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Well, I started uh, in technology 20 years ago when mm -hmm. we were doing fiber deployments and and DSL was the big thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was dealing with tri-mode cell phones and building out cell towers. And we had what we call the cow, which was a cell tower on wheels. And, you know, this type of thing was back in the early days of, of um, all of that. And so to watch where technology has gone, I've, I've been running right along on, on that ride. And I have been the only female in my, uh, in the majority of my, uh, oftentimes in the company or mm -hmm. in leadership positions. Mm -hmm. And so it has really opened me up to understand how important diversity and inclusion and belonging is in, in business and what it can do for us if we are, if we care about those things and if we develop strategies around those that we can be more successful in our businesses and also in our careers. But this isn't necessarily your, I mean, you're more on like the product uh, management role. So how did you get into more of like this inclusion? I mean, cause almost this t starts to get into like some of the HR pieces, doesn't it? Yeah, it absolutely does. There's a lot of overlap, but uh, I have been in uh, leadership probably since about the year 2000. So about last 18 years uh -huh. in, in leadership and technology. Okay. And so as I look at that, I have been part of an underserved population. Mm -hmm. Women, uh, when I was a vice president of, of product, I only about 2% of female or, or executives in technology were female at that time. And so it, wow. it really, um, it, I really started gaining awareness. And when I moved to Salt Lake City, um, I started to get involved with some of the, the local groups, women tech events, um, and, and some of the other um, groups that help promote these type of things. And it really helped to change my management style and really helped me care about developing out these strategies in my own teams. And, and as a leader, I have the opportunity to, even if it's not a corporate-wide initiative, I have the opportunity to impact change sure. in my own department sure. and in my own sphere. And so I've taken the opportunity to do that. What problems were you seeing over the last 15 years when, when companies were struggling with this inclusion piece? What problems were you seeing come from that? Well, the I mean, the business case is really solid for it. And, and you know, if you look at a team of problem solvers, um, a more div diverse team of problem solvers will outperform a team of highly qualified 
um, problem solvers every time. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you look at um, innovation and growth, um, if you have a a team that is completely like-minded and they're all the same, Mm -hmm. you're not going to perform as well. And you you look at um, even executive boards. Um, They have a more diverse executive team they have higher earnings and they have a higher return on equity Uh, and so it's really important to help bring that diversity in so that you can have a stronger business totally that makes sense so currently uh you're at western governors university i am um and i believe you just accepted an award on behalf of on behalf of Western Governors, or what was yes, this award? Tell me yes. about that. So, so I was um, able to present at the Women Innovation Tech Summit uh-huh. that the Women Tech Council put on, and I was presenting on why Western Governors is a great place uh, for women. Mm-hmm. And so I was able to put out our statistics of, of, of how many women are in our company and, and what our recruiting strategies are on, and those type of things. And we actually won the award for the most innovative recruiting for women. Oh, that's a great lead into this because that, that kind of get, was get what gets us going down this topic. It was a couple months ago. I was working with uh, another woman who was helping me on the podcast show itself, and she was just saying, "Hey, have you reached out to Nisa yet?" I'm uh, pretty sure she just accepted an award, and I'm going, right. <laughs> "Well, that's pretty sweet." So uh, it's, it's a good time to be able to have you come in and talk a little bit about some of those techniques or some of those things that you've learned in this process. Um, but for before we get into it too deep. Tell me why you think it's important for us to be talking about this topic right now. Why is it important for us to be talking about this today? Well, I, th- I think it's important that we're bringing awareness uh, and because people know that they're, you know, they hear about, uh, uh, about biases and they hear about discrimination. And, but, but if you haven't lived it and you haven't experienced those type of things, you, you may not know what it's like or it may not be something that's important for you and you may not think that you can impact change. Mm-hmm. But but this is something that every person at every level of every company can help impact changes in, in this arena and, and can help your teams be more successful. Yeah. So what's the first, the first step in, in helping your company become more innovative? in you know diversity or inclusion what's the first step yeah I, that and that's an excellent question i i think that for me the first step is understanding your numbers you've got to understand what what the diversity looks like in your organization and if you're in a big organization and you don't know those numbers it, they can be difficult to get and so sure. sometimes it requires a third party survey because someone may be or or employees may have distrust for how are you going to use this information and those type of things but but it's important you know your numbers and you understand what does it look like because you may have problem areas that you don't even realize that you have if mm-hmm. you if you're just looking holistically at your company you know i just had the thought and this is being that we're based here in utah we are not the most diverse state in the country that's true. Uh, and so for many of the listeners who are listening to the show are from Utah. When they talk, when they hear people talk about diversity and inclusion, I know the first thing that comes to mind is women in the workplace. But this topic extends to more than just women in the workplace. This is all minorities, I, I assume, what you're, what you're addressing. Well, and it does. But there's there's actually two different types of, of diversity that that we can talk about. And one is, one is of course, the inherent diversity. And, mm-hmm. that's, and that's when you talk about race and gender and sexuality and, and those type of things. But when you talk about acquired um, diversity, that's your skill sets. And that's, that's um, you're looking at what, what have you acquired throughout your career. And you want to make sure that you've got diversity in those arenas mm-hmm. as well. Because if you're requiring a CS degree for all of your product managers, you're not, you don't have a very diverse way of thinking in, yeah. in your product management staff if, if that's, a, a, that's a requirement. And so, so if you're looking at acquired skills as where uh, or acquired diversity as well as your inherent diversity, um, it helps you even have a stronger strategy. Okay, that makes sense. So if we're starting to talk about hiring then, hiring diversity, what do we start to do in order to make sure that we're pulling in the right candidates? Yeah, uh, so one of the one of the first things that you can look at is your job descriptions. Okay. Uh, women tend to be if you have a, a checklist of things that uh, listed out that here's what the skills or qualifications you must have, a, a woman will look at that very differently than a man. They may look at it and say, oh, I need eight out of 10 or I'm not even going to apply. A guy may look at it and say, 
eh, two out of 10, I'm throwing my hat in the ring. Why mm-hmm. not? Because if I don't apply, the answer is already no. Yep. And so they will approach um, a job search a lot differently than what a female will. But, but you can also build in, um, uh, you can look at the wording, a, a masculine word like, um, like uh, even, oh, I'm trying to think of a couple examples of, of masculine words, um, something that's, that's like ambitious that may be perceived as a woman, you know, that man, that's, you know, that's an off-putting word to me. Ah, gotcha. And so they may be like, I don't want, I don't want to be ambitious. I want to work hard and I want to do, you know, and they may look at that word differently. Um, and so if you can avoid words that can be perceived masculine, sure. um, you can also make sure that you call out what are your strat- strategies on equal opportunity employment. Sure. Um, calling, just calling that out it will help you in getting a, a more diverse candidate pool because people that have disabilities or people uh, that are looking um, for an, an employee that values those type of things, they're going to check that box when they see that on a job description. Yeah. Um, another thing on job descriptions is is making sure that you're making them outcome-based rather yeah. than listing, here's a list of boxes you must check. Instead, say, here's the results that we want you to drive. Because a woman can look at that and say, um, hey, I can do that. Mm-hmm. Or, or, uh, or, a, or a diverse candidate from a different culture may look at it and say, oh, yeah, I can absolutely drive that result. But if you give them a, a one-sentence uh, one requirement, they may look at it and say, well, my experience isn't exactly that. Right. But if you're outcome based, then it's, it takes that that piece off the table mm-hmm. and everyone kind of looks at it through the same lens. Yep, absolutely. I can't remember if I told you this when we chatted on the phone, but I was following this guy on Twitter. He's a he's a UX designer and uh, he posted something on Twitter the other day and he just got I mean, this post just exploded. But what he said was and again, I think the the tone just wasn't accepted the right way, but right. he said something about here's just a word of advice. Men apply for the job beneath the one you think you should apply for and women apply for the job above the one you think you should apply for and he got torn apart <laughs> and it just started this massive feud and guess who it was that was throwing a fit about this it was the men and they were saying what well, you don't think we're capable what you don't think we can do this what you don't right. think uh, i'm the right person for the managerial job like you know they just went off and he's like you're missing the point and he's saying the same thing that men will apply themselves to to reach you know far above maybe what what they should be reaching well, for and they'll be very confident in their abilities confident and, that's probably a better and, way to say and, it. and women may be more hesitant about that yep. or or you may have um certain cultures that it's not as they're they're not as um brazen in their yep. approach and they may be more timid and yep. and a job description that is, has strong wording in it may turn off someone like that that would be a very effective candidate you know it was about about a year and a half ago i was uh hiring a couple different positions at domo and when i posted that we were hiring and started gathering applications i mean i think i probably got 30 resumes Mm -hmm. from men and uh one or two from women and it just it kind of floored me i was like i did not think it'd be this lopsided yeah, and that's actually really common. And and so if you're in a hiring, if you're a hiring manager, it's really important that you're looking at those ratios. Look for good ethnic diversity. Look for good gender diversity, and and make sure that you are are requiring your recruiters to give you solid candidates. And and they may tell you, uh, I had a recruiter actually tell me I had two out of thirty that were female candidates, and I said that's not acceptable. Mm-hmm. I want that ratio closer to fifty percent. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, then we're going to have to maybe go down in our in our requirements and, and it's in order to get qualified candidates. And I said that is not accurate. I said we need to change our approach. We need to change our pipeline. We need to change the the channels that we're pursuing yeah. because the candidates are out there. Yeah, absolutely. I think what I I did in my scenario that I was in is like I started looking into different groups into different means of attracting the talent uh, because again from my perspective from my boss uh, his perspective as well was you know, this isn't gonna work you know so we found a, a local uh, meetup group that was specifically designed for yep. ladies in in user experience design and talked to a couple of like the the people who run the group and they sent out the posting to their group and 
within 48 hours, I had a couple dozen resumes from the women in the space. And it was just kind of mind blowing to me that, that I knew that the women were uh, in the group that I posted the original posting to. They just didn't apply for it. But what I found in the feedback that I got is because they knew that I went out of my way to, to try and get them to apply for it, they had a better response to it. Uh, so although they saw it in the first group, they didn't want to apply. When they knew that Domo was going out of their way to, to reach out to them in, the, in a separate group, they started applying for it. And it was a really cool experience to go through. And it kind of brought my attention to, uh, I guess, just the differences in how we approach these job uh uh, these hiring positions. So. Yeah. And you'll find that diverse candidates look for companies that they can see value diversity. And so if your job description isn't articulating that, or you're not going into channels that, mm -hmm. that diverse groups value, um, one example would be like the African American chamber of commerce. Yep. If you're advertising there, they're, you know, they're going to say, Oh, this company values diversity. So what are some of the more out of the box things that you've done to make sure that in your hiring process, you've got a full diversity pool. Yeah, so so that example of, of reaching out to those groups, I think uh -huh. that's that's a great one. Um, and that was one of the examples that we, that I called out on stage for at the Innovation Summit, sure. that, that, that that group thought was, was really innovative because there are groups that, that represent underrepresented populations and reaching out specifically to those groups and understanding how, how, um, our, how, trying to recruit talent from sp specific segments mm -hmm. can benefit you. Uh, that's, that's really powerful. There's that data is out there, but you might have to go look and understand why would I care about hiring someone with disabilities yeah. and what could the potential benefits be to my company? Yeah. And what, what about someone that's, that's trying to, that's been in prison and, and they want to, um, they're trying to get back into society and, and what are the benefits for my company of hiring someone like that? Mm -hmm. And, and understanding those type of things, I think is really an important strategy in, and something that I don't know if a lot of companies are spending the time to do the research on the front end. They're talking about diversity, they're talking about inclusion, but are they really spending the time to do the research to understand yeah. how it can benefit them? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So let's say at this point in time, then as uh, someone who's in that hiring manager role, they've got this pool of candidates that represents a pretty diverse group. Uh, they start to make the hires, they start to build a team based on some of this information you presented about more diverse teams being more effective teams. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got them in the door, they got them at their seat. Yeah. Now we start to talk about inclusion inside of the workplace. How does it transform from hiring into the workplace? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And actually, I want to touch on a couple ideas in that in that hiring phase, okay. because even once you get do get them through the door, uh, you there are people and there are companies now that are going to blind resumes, they take the names off of the resumes, so they can't see, is it a man? Is it a woman? Is it an ethnic name? Those type of things, they take the names off of the resume. Another thing that I'm seeing is, is companies that will do blind interviews. They, they don't allow you to see the candidates um, face to face because mm. of the biases that can come from mm. uh, seeing how the person looks. So there are additional strategies that you can implement. Interesting. There. I've never heard of that. Uh, and so the next thing, once you do get them through the door, is, is you've got to show them that you really value um, diversity and you know there's inclusion there's a lot of inclusion initiatives yeah. and they, and their people are really talking about including making diverse groups feel and and underrepresented populations feel valued and feel like they belong in your company sure and and that that term belonging that's kind of the new way that this is going and the new conversation that's belonging. happening belonging is 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 diff is it goes a little bit deeper and it's about I think it's an easier conversation to have because sometimes the term diversity and the term inclusion can be off-putting. Yeah. But but if you're talking about belonging somewhere, it, it's an easier conversation to have. And and the difference in belonging is is that you're embraced for exactly who you are. You sure. don't have to give up important parts of yourself in order to fit in. So that's what I was going to say. So you're saying it's deeper than just fitting in. It's deeper than, and it's actually the opposite of fitting in. There's an author that I absolutely love. Her name is Brene Brown, and she does a lot. She's done years and years of study mm -hmm. on, on this concept of belonging. And the one thing that 
that it came down to is is people want to belong. They want to fit in. They want to be part of a community, but not if they have to give up their authenticity, their yeah. freedom, or their power. Yeah. And and so they want to be able to be exactly who they are and have people love them for it. Ooh. And so this that's the concept of belonging. And and it's very easy actually to implement in a workplace if you are willing to embrace embrace people's differences rather than trying to make people conform to exactly you know to be to be the same as what you sure are. sure that makes sense it, it sounds like a lot of uh, a lot of awareness that needs to take place inside of the company then i mean we just had a uh, a diversity training a couple months back Mm -hmm. And the focus of this training, I believe this group that did the training, they're from New York. They've done trainings with, uh, I think they even said most like the top fortune 500 companies. Like they've done this training for a lot of big companies and they come on, they come in and they, they've got like actors who are paid to kind of go through these skits. And at first it kind of seems a little hokey. Like really, we're going to sit through these little skits and talk about like, how what was awkward there? And it just seems like, come on, that's, but what it actually really did was brought to light the different types of their focus was the ins and outs groups. Uh, you know, just the, the things that are said in a meeting or the body language in a meeting that creates the in and the out. Uh, you know, one of the examples that we had someone internal share was, you know, I sit in a meeting with all these men and the, the manager is at one end of the table. And for some reason, I'm always at the back of the table. And therefore, everyone turns their back to me. So when I need someone to say something, I've got everyone's back and nobody's turning to, to give, you know, the, the attention to who's speaking. So many different things like that that I'm just going, I've never, I never would have thought of that. Um, how do you teach or how do you encourage people to be more self-aware of their surroundings? And, and once you do have somebody, you know, from the hiring process now at the table at your company. Yeah. And I, I think that that goes back to that awareness statement. It really is having the conversation in your workplace. It's understanding, having focus groups so you understand what's important to different groups, understand mm-hmm. what's important to different people generally. I mean, I'm I'm certain that if you were to have that conversation with that leader, he would immediately change the dynamic of how that how that meeting is being ran. He would adjust things so that it's more and more inclusive for you. Right. But sometimes people are too shy to speak up. And so there ha- from a leadership standpoint and people that are in leadership positions, they need to own this and they need to to look at it in their sphere and say how how am I doing in my department? How are my meetings? Am I allowing everyone to have a voice? Mm-hmm. And they need to do that. But then when you look at individual employees, Culture can be built from the bottom up just as easy as it can be from the top down mm. and, and actually can be much more powerful if it is built from the bottom up. Um, at a recent, uh, our, our tech summit that we had with Western Governors uh, just last week, we actually had a couple different breakout sessions where we t- talked about belonging and this concept with employees and and it was called culture of belonging Mm -hmm. we had a full house people were interested in this and people wanted to see how they could help impact change and how they could help build a culture of belonging at western governors university and so what we and some of these people as we started in they're like oh my goodness what have i gotten myself into you know when i'm talking about we need to be open and we need to let people see our true authentic selves Mm -hmm. and we need to share with each other what our hobbies are and and we need to be able to connect on the things that we have in common some people were thinking oh my goodness what have i gotten myself into sure. but then they walk out of the session and we had gone through an activity where it was really focused around what do we have in common yeah. because that's how you promote a culture of belonging you yeah. focus on the things that that you have in common not necessarily on all the things that are different yeah. and so these employees walked out really feeling closer to each other they felt excited to get back to work and to help spread this with within their own teams and they they saw how they could make a difference yeah. and so i think that's how we continue to grow this and and continue to impact change once we bring employees through the door let every employee know they can make an impact yeah well and i think you said it starts with just having the conversations first starts with understanding people first you know another one of these things that came out of that diversity training was like some of the assumed things that we have in common right the assumed stereotypes yep exactly uh i think they did one of them where it was 
you know, they did this skit where this white guy had walked up to the black guy and just said, Hey, did you catch the game last night? And the guy was like, uh, yeah. And it was just very obvious that he wasn't into sports, you know? And so they, they just kind of bring to light that not all guys like sports, not all right. black guys play basketball, you know, and these stereotypes that, uh, you can assume don't create an even ground. Uh, and it starts with first talking and getting to know people and having the conversation first to find that level of ground. Is that right? Yeah, that's absolutely. And, and I've played that game before and it is, it is interesting when you say, uh, and the way they, they stage this for us is they said, I am a blank, but I'm have never blank. And so there were examples like I'm a, I'm a white man, but, or, or I'm a black man, but I can't jump. <laughs> and, you know, so those type of things, those stereotypes that we have in our mind, and we just assume that it must be true about that person, that's probably, you know, those will be proven wrong more often than not. Yeah. Um, before we wrap, I, I do want to ask, I mean, is there other thoughts that you've got on, on creating these inclusive environments here in the, the office place? Well, I guess I just put the challenge out there to every employee in each company to make the impact that you can within the sphere that you're in. You don't have to be in a leadership position to make a change for someone else. And you don't have to be uh, you don't have to be asked to do it. You can reach out and you can say, OK, am I including everyone around me? And am I creating an environment around me and in my team meetings that allow people to feel like they can just be themselves? Because if they can just be themselves, they're going to feel like they belong and they're going to, it will increase their happiness. It will increase their ability to perform and what they contribute to the team. And so make a difference, make an impact for exactly in exactly where you are right now, mm -hmm. because that's within your grasp. Let me take it on maybe just another two minute tangent, because I'm curious in this Obviously, you're very into this topic, and so you're very aware of this topic and, and educating the members on your team. How do you take someone, though, who's not aware to aware? Uh, I mean, obviously, you're going to do your job to bring, I guess, awareness to this, but mm -hmm. I'm just thinking, like, maybe the person who's listening to the podcast that goes, like, well, oh, I never knew I had to pay attention to this. I never knew that this was an issue. How do you help someone become aware? What is the easiest thing to do? Yeah, I think that uh, if your company does not have strategies around this and they're not talking about they're not talking about um, diverse recruiting and they're not talking about uh, what how inclusion can benefit or, or what how to create a, an inclusive environment and they're not talking about how do we make a, a, how do we build this culture of belonging? Start talking with your leaders and mm -hmm. say, what can we do here? And raise your hand to be involved in it. And, sure. and if they understand that, hey, people care about this and they want the company to implement these type of programs, then then you can help to raise the awareness with your own leadership teams. But the one thing that I've done on my own, I've taken the initiative to go out to trainings and I've gone to meetups and I've gone to different things to help expand my own awareness of mm -hmm. it. And I and that's how I've gotten to where I am and why I'm so passionate sure. about it is because I said, okay, I've heard about this. Now I want to learn about this. And I've taken that self-initiative because it wasn't prevalent in the companies that I was working well, in. I was going to say it hit and home for you. It did, absolutely. And I looked at it and said, hey, I can impact change in this mm -hmm. arena. This is something I can help with because I've been a member of an underrepresented population as being a woman, a woman in tech. Yep. So there's meetups, there's events, there's things that you can go to. Hopefully your business, your company has uh, events that they're putting on. Uh, any books or any reads or talks that, that you'd... Uh, you yeah, I mentioned, I mentioned Brene Brown. Um, she's She's got a book out called um, Brave the Wilderness or something like that. I, I, I can't remember the exact name. Braving the Wilderness, I okay. think. Uh, and she also has on Netflix, if, if you're much more of a Netflix watcher, jump on Netflix and Google Brene Brown. She's got a fantastic piece on on this and belonging. And she talks a lot about vulnerability and how hmm. you have to be willing to put yourself out there. Uh, but there, there's a lot of um, internet resources. You can cool. go, you can Google um, how to write a more diverse job description, and cool. there's all the resources that you need. Or there's um, resources on promoting belonging, a culture of belonging in a workplace, and that conversation is becoming bigger and bigger. And the resources are out there. Okay, well, I'll share a couple of those links in the description of this episode because uh, I do think it's worth the time for people to go in and jump in it. Thank you, Nisa, for all your time. Um, 
Is there a way for people to reach out and connect with you moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. I'm on LinkedIn, so okay. reach out to me there. I will be at the women uh, the women tech awards uh, in on October 9th. I'll be okay. there, and so you can look for me there and feel free to come up and say hi and. I uh, love to continue this conversation and uh, love to continue to help promote it with people who are interested in doing more and impacting change in their sphere. Well, thank you for all that you're doing in the community to promote this. Uh, thank you for getting this conversation started and thank you for coming on and sharing it with me. Yeah, thank you. Okay, that's a wrap for Design Today.